today we're going to answer some subscriber questions on the sound of Safe and Sound Texas. Hello YouTube, I'm back. It's March 3rd. Thanks for joining again. David Bianco here. I thought I'd get this first official episode going by uh, addressing a question I had or several questions that were in a comment uh, on the on the uh, YouTube page here. And uh, this one's from Lisa and she's a musician and lover of music. She asked about several subjects so we'll try to tackle uh, at least a few of them here learning more about how to pick our sound systems. Now that's a that's an easy one in some ways and a difficult one in others, but she also followed up with how do various genres sound on different systems. So that's a that is a very relevant uh, type of insight there uh, related to making that selection. So I guess we're going to start with um, talking about picking out a system. So, you know, a system is going to have functions in it. So you have to decide uh, at the beginning of the process what are the functions that you want to be able to utilize through this system. Um, for example, do you want to hook a turntable up to it or not? Uh, do you want to hook a CD player on it? Do you want it to directly be able to pick up Bluetooth that's streaming from your phone, for example. Uh, so, so again, these inputs and sources are critical to making the decision about a system. Uh, the other thing is, do you want it to be a compact system where it's more or less an all-in-one, uh, maybe even having uh, the speakers included? Um, the bottom line in that regard is the more you compromise and the more you uh, bring in um, multi-functions and uh, jack of all trades uh, and, you know, have fairly relatively inexpensive, uh, meaning, you know, inexpensive being under a couple hundred dollars, then you're definitely compromising in some areas. So uh, the one area that really is specific is vinyl because it's, you know, if you pop a CD into something, uh, player A and player B and player C are pretty much all going to work the same as far as rotation and the laser reading the CD and functionally uh, it's not going to wear or be damaged uh, from one player to another. The way it sounds will be impacted, but with vinyl there's a, a consideration that's a little bit unique and that is uh, vinyl can wear uh, very easily. Uh, we have to recognize that um, on, a, on a turntable or a record player, whatever you want to call it, the device that actually touches the record uh, is a needle uh, diamond stylus in most cases. Stylus is another word for needle. Uh, the old days there was one, they had a ceramic type cartridge, but most of them are what are called uh, moving magnet cartridges, MMs. And uh, that's how it processes the information and uh, the accuracy of that. But the stylus is the thing that touches the record and can do damage or provide wear to it. And so the lower end um, record players, and I'm going to separate here the term record player from turntable. A record player is one of these uh, cheaper type things and maybe in a suitcase type environment uh, uh, where you can carry it around or it's an all-in-one where it does everything. Uh, some of these that will look like old radios and uh, you flip the top and there's a, a record player in there. These typically have very um, minimalistic capabilities in terms of the stylus um, is not going to be the highest quality. The tone arm, the part that the stylus is connected to that goes toward the back uh, right, uh, upper right of the turntable, 
is typically not going to be high quality and calibrated to a certain weight of pressure uh, that is put on a record. So um, you're really kind of, uh, it's a crapshoot a bit with that. You, you can pretty well presume you will wear records uh, prematurely with that type of a setup. And, and that's fine. You pay five bucks for a record. It's a used record. Hey, play it for a while. No criticism here. Just recognize that that's the case uh, because the diamond and the vinyl, you know, have to have a symbiotic relationship. And if the diamond is grinding into the vinyl, it will tear and chip pieces off microscopically. And a lot of the time that is the actual the highs and the things in your music. And you'll start hearing the result of that later on. And then if you put that record on a good turntable later on, you're really going to hear it. So recognize that. Again, you know, cost, budget, compromise, get it. No harm, no foul. Just telling you the honest truth. That's the way it is. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, it's a, it's a cost and economics kind of thing. Uh, you know, when you graduate up to a turntable, turntables have the ability to set the downward pressure on the stylus in grams. Uh, most styluses and cartridges run, you know, one and a half to two and a half grams of, of downward weight. Uh, there's also a thing called the vertical tracking. Uh, and and uh, that is because, uh, it, you know, th there is uh, there are forces that cause the record uh, style and the way it rotates and then the stylus in there to move toward the center. Uh, centrifugal force, if you know what centrifugal force is. So because of that turning, the stylus and the tone arm are driving toward the center. And so what happens is the inner groove, the, the side of the groove, because a groove is like a V, the side of the groove that is closest to the inner center of the record, as opposed to the outer groove, which is toward the outer edge of the record, the inner groove can wear more prematurely because that, that motion is pulling it toward the center with centrifugal force. And now what you need, turntables have, many of them have a thing called anti-skating. So it's trying to create a resistance back against the tone arm so that it causes it to kind of stay centered in the groove and it offsets that pull and it anti-skate to stop it from skating toward the center. You know, I always tell people, hey, if you know you really want to want to have an interesting little uh, test, see if your anti skating is working properly. Uh, take a CD, maybe an old CD or one you don't care about. Take a CD and put it on the center of the turntable uh, and center it up, and then bring over your tone arm and drop it down toward uh, you know onto the CD and watch what happens. If it starts driving straight to the center, you know your anti-skating is not working properly. You don't have enough anti-skate pulling it. When you put it down, it should pretty well kind of try to stay right where it's at. And again, a CD doesn't have any grooves. It's a flat surface. So it's, you know, its natural thing is going to be to pick up that centrifugal force and go. Well, if it goes and then you put a record on internally in that groove, it's trying to go. It's still trying to go, and it's wearing that inner groove. So um, I always tell people, do you want to play a record or do you want to cut a record? Because your vinyl can literally get cut by that diamond if it's not set up properly. So, um, so you know, it all boils down to what functions you want to have in a system, and then, you know, how much you can spend. But a, a decent turntable that has the right type features to offset this tracking issue, both um, vertically with the actual weight of the grams down into the groove and the anti-skate offset. You know, one of those is gonna cost you around two, 250, I would say, somewhere in their uh, US dollars. Uh, and that then will need a, require some type of device 
to amplify the signal that's in it as well. So uh, an amplifier or receiver, the difference between an amplifier and a receiver is a receiver, it's an older term, and it used, had AM and FM tuning in it as well. So if you don't care about AM and FM, you don't really need a receiver. You can use an amp of some kind. Um, and there are integrated amps, which is what you really want, because otherwise you're talking about two other separate components, an amplifier head unit and then a preamp. And the preamp has all the controls in it and sends the signal to the amp and the amp sends it to the speakers. With an integrated amp, all the functions and controls are built into that unit along with the amplification. So you just hook your speakers into one unit. So again, receivers do AM, FM, uh, amplifiers uh, don't have that, but they pull in other sources. They have uh, auxiliary inputs for like CDs uh, or auxiliary inputs for uh, even a, a video uh, input. Uh, they also potentially can have a Bluetooth capability to be able to stream to the unit. Newer units have that capability. There are also small remote units that um, you can buy, which uh, pick up your Bluetooth signal, and then that is plugged into a power source, and then it has two jacks that go out into your receiver as like an auxiliary input. So the Bluetooth goes into that device and then goes into the left and right channel leads that goes into your uh, amplifier. So that's a that's kind of a bridge technology. It bridges older equipment or equipment that doesn't have Bluetooth built in with that. So, so you got to know what functionality you want, you know. Um, so and then, of course, speakers. Speakers are what you listen to. They make all the difference in the world. We had a bit of a discussion on the last show about uh, that. We had a discussion about Bose and how they basically had a bad rap. And I, I just read an article, I posted it, and I'll put a link uh, on here for it as well, uh, back where there was actually a lawsuit that Bose won. And I think it made it all the way to the Supreme Court They they against the Consumers Union, which is Consumers Reports. And they basically, Bose proved in court that there was a writer that had malice toward Bose and, and went out of his way to, uh, to do things that slandered them. And Bose actually won that lawsuit. So uh, uh, it's an interesting read. But again, speakers really make up the predominant aspect of a system in terms of um, you know, what you hear. So um, that gets into the discussion now a bit about genres of music. Um, you know, again, I have to always get back to the point that what sound you like in terms of you want a lot of pounding deep bass and do you want that kind of uh, experience and you don't care about the high end or do you like the high end and you don't want quite as much bass. You know, classical music isn't really usually bass it's more mid-range and upper uh, range. There is some bass, but it doesn't usually go that deep. Um, and so, you know, that genre maybe doesn't require as strong of a bass uh, capability of a speaker. Uh, whereas rock, of course, uh, would, pop would, metal would, uh, rap would. I mean, those all really, that's a big content. So, you know, you, you want speakers that really uh, for your classical and for maybe your, you know, just your vocal, you know, kind of pop stuff uh, that doesn't really have driving beats or anything. You know, a nice mid-range for voice and, and reproduction of, of the instruments and then a good, you know, high end for crispness, I think, is more what you would probably be leaning toward uh, in what you're looking for. So again, you know, that again gets down to um, knowing, in fact, what sounds best to you. And then if you have a really broad genre, you have to find a way to find the balance. You know, and I would tell you, if you play some rock, but that's not your thing, really, and you just, you have some, uh, but that's really not where you're focused, then maybe the bass thing is not as big a deal to you, even though you play it some. So, um, you know, these are the kind of considerations you have. Uh, one of the other aspects of her question was about headphones and earbuds being harmful to our ears. Okay. Well, uh, yes, they can be. 
definitely. How loud you play it is really the bottom line. How many decibels, you know, and you're getting, you get up in, you know, over 85 decibels or so, it can be very harmful. So, uh, and how long you keep it in, how long is it sustained? Uh, because there's peaks, you know, and those uh, over time can do some damage, but it's a sustained uh, loudness that is really uh, the issue. I did notice um, a feature on my iPhone the uh, the other day that came up, and I was listening to um, for several hours on end. I was listening uh, to a, a song uh, done by um, a group called Disturbed, uh, which is a heavy kind of a metal group, and uh, out of Chicago that a friend of mine made me aware about. And they did a remake uh, of The Sounds of Silence, Simon and Garfunkel song, pretty mellow song. And all I can tell you is uh, this gentleman, I know his name's Dave, I can't remember his last name, but he, he delivered a, uh, a vocal performance against that song that totally told the meaning of the song. I've heard the song any number of times and I knew what it was about kind of, uh, but uh, Simon and Garfunkel made it kind of a poppy song, you know, and I don't think you really get the intensity of what they're really trying to tell you. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I would encourage you to watch that video. It's been watched millions of times uh, and has had tens of millions of streams on Spotify. Amazing. I can't, you know, it's one of those things I can't believe I really just came across it. And he did a rendition of it on the Conan that's also live, and uh, and and he did it. Uh, and it's on YouTube. He, uh, it, it's just unbelievable. And later on, I read that he was actually sick that day. He had allergies, and he was really, um, uh, I'll say disturbed, but that's the name of the group. But he was really not happy with uh, his performance, actually. And you're like, really? Okay, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Okay, it wasn't. You know, there are a couple of places where maybe you could say I heard a little nasal this, but I mean, we're we're really. Uh, you know, really splitting hairs when we do that, I think. Anyway, my point to you was that I listened to that for many hours uh, because it really impacted me personally. And my phone, it came up and said, you know, you've exceeded the amount of time and um, decibel pressure that is rec that would be recommended and could damage your hearing. So actually the, the phone uh, and the software, the iOS software is monitoring that. So, um, so that exists. Um, but I do want to tell you that you shouldn't be afraid to listen on headphones. You should just do it judiciously. And I will tell you, we'll have a special uh, episode on this, of course, uh, that that is really for me, if you really want to experience music, um, you know, uh, and really think about it and really immerse yourself. Headphones are really the only way to go. Uh, speakers are great, you know, the portability, walking around and listening, and they're, they certainly can provide much more of a uh, experience to your body, especially if you have driving beats and things like that. Uh, but uh, as far as the vocals and really picking out instruments and clarity, uh, headphones are really good. But, you know, you got to have good headphones. And, uh, you, you know, you can get good headphones for $70, $80, I'd say. Um, you know, that sounds like a lot when you can get them for 10 but you get what you pay for, right? So, uh, so yeah, they can have issues. Uh, taking care of vinyls. I'm going to um, uh, table that uh, for a separate episode because there's a lot of aspects to that. So, uh, Lisa, thanks for the questions. Um you know, any specific recommendations you're looking for now that you've heard some of these uh, uh, areas that you want to consider, let me know. I think that it's uh, it's a question a lot of people have. There's a lot of stuff out there, um, and a lot of it is multifunction. And uh, again, it does a reasonable job. Uh, it's cost effective. Uh, like I said, if you're, you're buying a $5 album that's used and you're listening to it, and you can just as well throw it away in a couple of years. That's fine. I mean, that's that's okay. 
I mean, that's uh, that's part of vinyl collecting too. But just realize that that there there are consequences related to that. Uh, I mean, other sources coming in, it's a matter of, you know, the amplification power matching the speakers. Uh, I had a gentleman just wrapping up with this. I had a gentleman contact me the other day. He said, hey, I had these book bookshelf speakers and I have this nice Onkyo uh, AV receiver. And, you know, I, I, I had my, uh, I only had to turn my, uh, my volume up to um, on a scale of like zero to 140. Uh, to it, it to sound loud and decent. And he said, I got these new Polk RTA-12s, which are big tower speakers that can handle 500 watts. And he said, now I got to turn it up to like 80, you know, out of 100 on the, on the you know, receiver. What, what's wrong? And it's like, well, you, you're trying to drive a lot more speaker uh, with that particular uh, unit so it's going to require and demand more power the uh, the amplifier was rated at 100 watts uh, output which is plenty for a, for a small bookshelf speaker but he you know he tripled the 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 size and volume of uh, you know air to move and uh, the coils to move in the speakers with this so you know it takes more energy to uh, literally to uh, to make that happen, so matching all those is is really important. So uh, the good news is there's a lot of choices in the market. There's a lot, uh, you know, it's almost too much in a way, you know, trying to find things. But it is uh, it is very uh, easy to build the system uh, if you have you know if you have like let's say five hundred dollars, maybe six. You can pretty build a pretty decent um, setup. Some nice bookshelf speakers, um, uh, amplification. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, there's literally speakers that are amplified themselves, uh, and all you have to do is is plug in your turntable or a source. Uh, you know, a little. They have little uh, amplifiers that. Uh, you know, even cost eighty, a hundred dollars. That'll drive little bookshelf speakers. So again, five hundred dollars or so. If you're in vinyl, I'd say you could do pretty well, uh, and it'll sound pretty darn good for the money. Uh, you know, it really. You don't have to spend thousands if you want to, and you can. Great, it's going to sound better, no doubt. But you know, if you want to just not ruin your records, and you want to have some flexibility on what you listen to, and have a nice uh, setup that's not huge because you have space constraints, yeah, you can do that, definitely. Before I sign off today, I want to make you aware of a little contest I'm going to be running. So at the beginning of our videos, I have a little uh, intro and then uh, a video plays with a spinning logo from my company and it also has some music in the background. And it also then at the end of the video shows you four pieces of equipment, one in each quadrant, and uh, they are vintage pieces of equipment. I selected them for a special reason that I'll share with you at some point. But what I'd like you to do is go back, take a look at that, see if you can identify the manufacturer and brand name and the model number of that specific equipment. There's some speakers, there's a tape deck, there's a turntable, and there's a receiver. So four of them, and you gotta get them all right. Again, manufacturer, and the model number. You're going to win a great prize. So put your answers in the comments. I look forward to that and let's see who wins it. Until next time, please subscribe if you haven't already. Set that alert bell. Also like the video if you did and also comment anything you want to talk about or any questions that you might have. And again, you can win something very special if you get in the contest and put in those four pieces of equipment. Thanks again. Take care from the sound of Safe and Sound, Texas.